In this episode of Restore It, it's more progress for the 325i Touring. I'm going to be dealing with the rust in the sunroof, which includes this mounting bracket that has completely rusted away. I'm going to try and find out why it's almost impossible to get the car into 5th gear and hopefully fix the issue. I'm going to fit some new parts to the engine and fuel supply to see if that improves the rough idle. And finally, I'm going to remove the surface rust in the footwells and find all of the serious repairs that will need welding. So to get started with this sunroof repair, I first need to remove this plastic clip that part of the sunroof mechanism attaches to, so that I can see exactly what it is that I need to make for the other side. It feels like these two have been attached to each other for about 33 years. It really does not want to come off. With that out of the way, I can now use a piece of paper to mark around the edge of the piece. This will give me a pretty accurate outline to work with when it comes to making the new one. So finally, I get a chance to use the Pro MIG 250 from Artec Welding and the MIDI Pro Modular Welding Table from Mac Industries, which I haven't had the chance to use recently. To start with, I'm going to cut the bottom section to roughly the correct size, but leave the top section slightly longer than it needs to be, as the 90 degree bend will change the overall length of the piece, which makes it difficult to make as a flat piece all in one go. I'm transferring the paper stencil onto metal and cutting it slightly larger than it should be, as it's easy to remove metal and really annoying to put it back. So now I have the bottom piece cut to shape, I can add the 90 degree bend using a vise and a hammer. I'd say the bottom section is a few millimetres too long, but I'll shorten it on the belt sander just before I weld it in. But for now, I'm going to focus on the top section that grips onto the plastic clip. The other half of the original mounting piece is still inside the plastic clip that attaches to the part of the sunroof mechanism, I'm going to separate these three and see if the plastic clip has survived and also get my hands on the top part of the original bracket so I can copy it onto the new one. So the bad news is that the plastic clip has been split apart by the metal expanding due to rust. But the good news, I think, is that BMWs still sell them to this day for £9 each. So I've ordered one to my local dealership. As you can see on this diagram, number 11 is greyed out as it's no longer available or was never available in the first place, which is why we're making a new one. But number 14 on this diagram is available and that's the little plastic clip that I'm after. And that's its part number for anyone who's wondering. So with the top half free from the clip, I can now use it to make the new one. But before I do that, I want to quickly tell you about Keeps and how they're helping men to keep the hair they have and even regrow the hair they've lost. Keeps is a convenient online subscription service that makes it easy and more affordable for men to treat their male pattern baldness from the comfort of their own home. Whether you're looking to prevent hair loss, stimulate hair growth or just take better care of the hair you have, Keeps has you covered. Their treatments are clinically proven to address hair loss and boost hairy growth. Keeps treatment plans are affordable, typically half the cost of traditional pharmacy prices and you can get expert care for hair loss without ever visiting a medical professional office or pharmacy as the treatments are delivered right to your door in discreet non-branded packaging. To get started, just complete an online consultation to get matched with a treatment plan unique to your needs recommended by a licensed medical practitioner. Most of Keeps customers notice results within about 6 months of starting the treatment. To date, they have helped nearly 1 million men keep their hair and have over 5,000 5 star reviews. Thanks to Keeps for sponsoring this episode and for the free product, Hair Loss Stops with Keeps. For a special offer to get started, go to keeps.com forward slash restore it or click the link in the video description. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com forward slash restore it. Let's get back to this bracket. Using the old piece as a guide, I'm using a pen to mark all of the material that will need to be removed. For some reason, my camera didn't want to record the start of this, but I'm using a die grinding bit in a rotary tool to shape the piece. I'm testing the plastic clip as I go to make sure it's as tight as possible while still being able to be removed. It's almost there, I just need to remove some more material from the left hand side and it should be good to go. And there we go, that should do the trick. The middle part of mine is a bit bigger than the original, but I think it makes up for it by being a tiny bit wider. I'll use a bit of adhesive to make sure it won't come off unless it's pried with something, but even without any, it does feel quite tight. So the next thing I need to do, before I can weld the new one in, is to remove what's left of the old one. 
Before I remove the old one, I'm going to mark its location by scoring the metal around it so I know exactly where to put the new one. And to remove it, I'm using a finger sander and some 40 grit sanding belts. For some reason, the belts keep breaking, so I'm either cutting them down wrong, or they really just don't like this piece of metal. Anyway, after about 5 belts, it's now gone, along with all of the rust. I'm now going to give it one final clean up with the wire wheel, and then wipe it down with acetone. I can now mask up the sunroof rail and apply some weld through zinc rich primer to protect the bare metal under the mounting piece. So now that the car is ready, I need to drill a hole in the mounting piece which I'll use to plug weld it in place. I'm also keying the entire piece so the primer will have something to grip onto. With that done, I can now apply the same primer to the back before it gets welded in. To make sure I get this in the exact position that it needs to be in, I'm measuring the location of the other side as well as using the score marks that I made at the beginning. After a lot of fiddling, I can finally spot weld it in. And I definitely still need to get used to this welder. I don't think the earth was very good there, and I just didn't have it up high enough, as you can see from this second weld. I haven't really had a chance to use this welder properly since I got it, but soon I'll be making very good use of it. One, to finish this touring, and two, the 325i Sport. So there's going to be plenty of time for me to get used to the settings then. Even though that's not going anywhere, I don't like how easy it is to pry it up at the edges. I'm going to add two more tiny spot welds either side to give it a bit more strength. Well, these aren't the greatest welds either, and I'll be coming back to this to weld it along both sides just to make it look neater as this not being even just won't do. But for now, it really does feel like it's not going anywhere, and the clip and the sunroof arm fit nicely. Before I protect the new mounting piece with zinc primer, I'm going to remove all of the surface rust in and around the sunroof panel. I'm using 36 grit sanding discs, steel wire bits, sanding paper, and die grinding bits until all of the rust is gone, and only shiny bare metal remains. Later on in the project, I'll come back to the sunroof panel and remove all of the zinc primer I can get to and replace it with epoxy primer before it goes off to the painters. For now though, the sunroof is rust free and protected from rusting again. Both mounting pieces are now in place and the new clip is on its way from BMW, so we'll come back to this a bit later on in the project. For now though, I want to go back and take a look at that sticky fifth gear issue and see if I can get it sorted. With the car on the ramp, I'm loosening the gearbox mount and giving the gearbox a wiggle in the opposite direction to where it's getting stuck to see if that helps. After giving it a test, it still feels exactly the same. So I've got it back on the ramp to have a look at the linkages going from the shifter to the gearbox. And well, it's quite hard to show you, but I've found the mistake that's been made. The arm going from the shifter to the gearbox has been installed upside down by me whilst the gearbox and engine were out of the car in Spain. You can just about see where it's rubbing up against the output shaft. Thankfully, it's an easy fix. It's just a bit of a nightmare getting it off and back on again whilst everything is still attached to the car. With both front and rear clips off, I can simply remove the arm, flip it over and reinstall it. And would you look at that, it's like someone designed it to be this way. It's quite obvious when it's all in the car, but I made the mistake of installing it first and just guessing which way it went. So with the output shaft now spinning freely, we can check the gears. And thankfully, they feel exactly as they should. Fourth to fifth is effortless, and it no longer gets stuck when it's in there. Which I'm very pleased with. That's what I thought was going to be a big problem, ticked off the list. So moving on, if you remember back to the last episode, I got the engine running for the first time in four years, and it was a bit rough to say the least. The fuel pump was making some funny noises when I bench tested it, and a few of you mentioned seeing sparks coming from the HT leads. So the car is definitely in need of some new parts, and to start with I'm going to change the spark plugs, the fuel pump, the fuel filter, the oil filter, the air filter, the HT leads, and also add some coolant so I can let it idle for some time. So first of all I'm going to remove the HT leads. I didn't actually see the sparks you guys were talking about, but I'm taking your word for it and I appreciate you pointing it out to me. 
The case on this set of HT leads is broken where it attaches to the rocker cover anyway, so that's another good reason to replace it with a new set. With that disconnected from the plugs, the distributor, the coil pack and the ECU, I can now remove the old spark plugs. During the last episode when I pulled one of them out to check if I had spark, it wasn't looking too good, so I'm hoping a new set will make a big difference. And as you can see, they're in pretty rough shape. They're pretty carbon fouled and have actually started to rust, so it's definitely time for some new ones. So in they go, and I'm talking them down to 33 newton meters as per the manual. I can now add the new HT leads, which is a bit of a faff, making sure the distributor is wired up correctly and the cables are managed nicely. But at least it's now looking much neater than before. I cannot wait to give this engine bay a full detail at the end of the project, because underneath all of that rust is all of the work I did when I was in Spain. So make sure you check out the first part of this series if you haven't already. It's a few years back, but you'll find it. Up next, I'm going to change the air filter. This one looks almost brand new, but I might as well add the new one whilst I'm here. Something I've noticed as I'm changing the filter is that the large jerry clip for the air hose was missing when I first started the engine, which could have been contributing to the slow random increase in RPMs. So I'm going to add one now and see if it fixes that particular issue when I come to start the engine again in a moment. Next, I'm going to change the oil filter. I still need to do a full oil and coolant flush later on, at which point I'll install an even newer oil filter and fuel filter, but for now these ones will be used to help clean the system out as much as possible. With all of the engine parts swapped over, I'm now moving to the fuel supply. In the last episode I bench tested the fuel pump that's currently fitted to the tank, and it was making some crackling noises that made me feel as if it was about to die any second. And although it was working, it could have been contributing to the rough idle and overall crappy feel of the engine. So out comes the old one, and in goes the new one. I won't show you this whole process, as we've already been through it in the last episode. With everything back in place and hooked up, I can put the cover back on and fold the official carpet flap back over to complete the job. With that done, it's back on the ramp so I can get to the fuel filter. And I just want to say thanks again to Paul for the E30 that you can see in the background. You'll be seeing this blue four door that's been sat for 20 years on the channel at some point in the future. So to remove the fuel filter, I simply need to loosen the two hoses on either side and the large jerry clip that attaches it to the car. I've loosened the engine side of the filter and as you can see the petrol is coming out clean-ish, which is a good sign. However, the more I tip it down, the darker it becomes. So on the right is the fluid coming out of the filtered side, and on the left is what's coming out of the tank side. Pretty much pure liquid rust. Now that's either a very old filter, or the tank has some serious rust issues, so that'll be something I'll have to investigate when I get to the underside of the car. With the old one out of the way, the new filter can now be installed, and like I said before, this will be used right up until the car is finished, and then I'll change it a final time before it goes to the new owner. So we've got a new fuel pump and fuel filter, a new air filter and oil filter, new spark plugs and HT leads, and the math hose is definitely on right. Let's see how she starts now. It's definitely idling at lower RPMs, but it still feels a bit unhappy under throttle. I'm starting to think that it might be the pedal box or the cable that's causing this to happen, so I'll take a look at those later. For now, I'm going to fill it with coolant so I can let it idle for a bit and make sure there aren't any leaks or obvious issues. It's definitely starting much better now, but I'm sure you've just seen the large leak coming from the throttle body. That is not meant to happen. That aside, I just want to test the engine without the throttle cable involved to see how it's running.
it seems to be revving up much nicer than it was before. The throttle pedal or mechanism must be a bit stiff. It's idling at what sounds like normal RPMs and it isn't creeping up on its own anymore, so that's that issue fixed, I think. Once the second half of the exhaust is back on, I think this car will sound like its old self once again. I've never had such a cartoon-like leak from an engine. This is going to need one of these gaskets to fix the issue, and they go for around £15 each, so not too bad. I've seen some threads about deleting this part of the coolant system, but I think I'm just going to replace the gasket and leave it as it is. And the good news is that the rest of the system is leak free and the water pump is creating good circulation by the looks of it. Ignoring the coolant that I've just spilt on the right hand side, there is one small issue at the bottom of this engine. At some point, the bottom of this sump has been scraped along the ground, grinding down the little bit that sticks out to accommodate the sump plug, and is now leaking every time the oil gets warm. This will be an interesting thing to fix in a future episode. We'll come back to that leak and the rest of the engine in the next episode, but for now I'm going to move on to another issue that's been staring me in the face ever since I removed the carpet. The front and rear footwells have got a mix of rust stains that don't seem to be surface rust, real surface rust and full blown poke a hole through it rust. To get a better idea of what's actually needed, I want to remove all of the surface rust and all of the rust stains and then mark all of the spots that are going to need to be replaced with new metal. Before I get started, I need to remove these air ducts that channel hot or cold air to the rear seats. With those out of the way, I'm first going to remove some of the old soundproofing that is either not sticky anymore or no longer complete. Some of it is just resting here, not doing its job at all. This stuff has become so brittle, I can hammer and chisel most of it off quite easily. The throttle pedal is now in the way and needs to come off. But from what I can see here, the mounting bracket is pretty rusty and should probably be replaced with a new one whilst I'm here. Thankfully, E30 Garage Norway have them on tap. The pedal itself is removed by prying open the two clips on the front and one at the back in the middle. It's a bit of a faff, but once you get one loose, the rest will follow quite easily if you just keep upward tension on the pedal. And there are the three tabs that keep it in place. Taking a look at the mounting bracket, it's definitely a bit too crusty for my liking, and with them being so cheap to replace, it's a no-brainer. It's been so long since I've worked with this stuff that I forgot a heat gun is your best friend. I'm using one to remove the rest of the more stubborn parts that are still holding well after all of this time. Just a few seconds with the heat gun and this stuff turns into a Play-Doh like substance and it's coming right off. Now that all of the bad vibration damping is off, I've found a few more holes on the right hand side but overall it's not looking too bad. These footwells will give me a good chance to get used to the new welder on thin sheet metal. Now all I need to do is clean the area of old adhesive, remove the surface rust and decide which spots will need welding. Firstly, I'm using solvent and a scotch brite pad to loosen the old glue and rust stains. This will make it much easier to see where the real rust is. These two are making light work of that adhesive and the rust stains have vanished. As I was cleaning up the final bits of vibration dampening, I accidentally pushed the vacuum hose through the jacking point, the metal is that weak. It's a good job that E30 Garage Norway have these sections pre-made, as I'll be needing two of them, one for each side. As for the rest of the small holes, I'll be cutting and butting those with sheet metal, which unlike my first repairs on the 325i Sport, will be invisible. I'm now doing the same to the left hand side, which is in much better condition than the right. The front corner does need doing, but it's nowhere near as bad as the driver's side. I can't poke my way through from this side, at least. With that done, I can now see all of the spots that need to be dealt with. So now I'm going to grind down all of the surface rust to bare metal and protect it with zinc primer for now. I like to start with steel wire bits, as they remove most of the loose rust and it's less damaging than the standing discs. And now I'm coming back to each spot with a 36 grit sanding pad and carefully grinding down the rest until I reach clean metal. I've left all of the welding repairs as I'm going to come back to them and do them all in a single episode, possibly even the next episode. And the throttle pedal bracket and the two front jacking points will be done when my order arrives from E30 Garage Norway. I found another bad spot right next to this piece of vibration dampening that will need to be welded. So I may even pull that one up completely as well, just to be sure there aren't any more hiding underneath. With the right side done, I can now do the same to the left. 
I won't bore you with too much of this, as it went on for some time. With everything but the bad rust gone, I can now protect all of the bare metal with zinc primer, and at a later date I'll come back to the footwells and seal everything with some epoxy primer. So the left side has only 4 spots that will need to be cut out. The right hand side however is a bit worse off. Not only were there more spots of surface rust, but there are at least 7 spots that need to be cut out and replaced with new metal. So I'm glad I decided to remove the carpet. This may be a surface level restoration compared to the 325i Sport, but things like this need to be addressed as they'll just get worse and cause greater issues down the line. To give you a better view of what's needed, and to give myself a bright red reminder to get these done as soon as possible, I'm spraying each repair with red paint. Here's a quick before and after shot of the footwells. So there's actually 8 on the driver's side, and 3 slash 4 spots on the passenger side. And the rest is now ready for some paint and some new vibration dampening. I now feel a lot clearer about what is needed, and it's actually not as bad as I first thought. It was the rust stains that made it look a lot worse than it is. I also did the rear footwells, but they were nowhere near as bad as the fronts. Just the usual rust around the seat threads and threaded holes. So overall, I'm pretty happy with the progress made in this episode. I have a few things to address straight away in the next one, and I only need to wait for the new throttle body gasket to arrive, which is already on its way. In the next episode, I'm going to repair that throttle body, fix all of the rust spots in the footwells, top up the coolant so I can take it for a test drive to see if anything goes wrong, and also anything else I can squeeze in. So that's all I had time for this episode, but we're making good progress, the car now starts well, idles nicely, and goes through all of the gears as it should. The sunroof is now rust free, and the footwells will soon be the same. Thanks so much for watching, especially if you've made it this far, and I'll see you in the next one.